Hi, Reality Riffing. Everyone's talking about human design, and it is a language that has become more and more popular. It's a fascinating science, and I was super interested to sit down with the genius mind of Erin Claire Jones, who is just really an incredible human design um, uh, reader, and um, she's been able to kind of deconstruct some of these more complex pieces of the human design and make them very palatable and understandable. So we had a really casual conversation about now, what all these bells and whistles and things, uh, the, all the things people are saying, I'm a projector, I'm a manifester, I'm a this, I'm a that, we broke it down uh, so that you can start to understand it and also utilize it with your families, with your relationships, and in your businesses and at work. Enjoy. I said on the... Um uh, I said on the, when I was talking about this interview, I called you one of the premier uh, human designologists. Um, but I really feel like you really have like a, you, you've kind of downloaded this from the future. Um, and, and I would love your take on the technology itself, because I think mm -hmm. it is kind of downloaded from the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, uh, joined by Erin Claire Jones, we're going to talk human design, take some questions and, and just kind of go riff wherever this goes. It's a, this is an informal reality riffing. So you can write your questions on the chat. Um, you can introduce yourself on the chat. You can introduce your, your human design on the chat if you know it. Um, or even maybe they could put their, their birth. Would, do you want people to put their birth stu uh, stuff in there in case you wanted? I mean, yeah, I would say put your, if you know your type, put your type there and your authority. I can also put a link there to look it up if you don't know. But yeah, it'd be useful to know who we have here. Awesome. I know that you're a projector, no? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Projector club. You know, it's funny because a lot of people are always surprised that I'm a projector. Because um, you do so much? Because I do so much. <laughs> but I think that has to do with some of the other stuff that you're probably going to explain to me. I'm very much a novice in this world. I understand it from like a, a yeah. an energy way, but, um, and it helps me hire well, actually. I have mm. to say. A lot of my work is with teams. It's just like such a useful tool in terms of like engineering functional teams and also knowing what kind of support we need. It's really helpful. I, I, I just started using it in the past couple hires and I just, I'm really like happy to, oh. uh, it's really helpful. Okay. So, so please introduce yourself. How'd you get into human design? Where, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, you know, I'd love to hear where you feel like this, like, you know, kind of the background or your, your intersection with it. Any, any yeah. Way? So um, I've been working with human design since 2015 and it was like a very serendipitous introduction. I live in New York and I was sitting at a gathering on the Lower East Side for those familiar with New York and a guy sat next to me and basically looked at my human design on his phone and started telling me all the stuff about myself that felt like so familiar and so innate. And it was like, I've never given myself permission to live that life, but that is like more than me than like anything I've ever heard. Um, and I was working in a lot of startups at the time and was just like pushing, pushing, pushing. And I was just like, all the teams that I'm working with are super dysfunctional. I'm super burnt out. And he started to really reveal to me how human design could not only be used to kind of transform us on an individual level, but honestly just becoming more of ourselves, but also on the team level, how to really support teams in kind of just becoming more functional by understanding how different each person is and honoring it. And I think also when I first discovered human design, I was like, there's so much gold in the system, but a lot of it isn't translated in ways that are very accessible for people. And so I basically just like made it my job to make it just like super simple, super accessible, super practical, because I think, you know, so often people don't need more information. They just need like the right tools at the right time to actually make changes in their lives. So that's really been my goal. My work is mostly with individuals and with teams um, and just kind of like bringing human design into the mainstream any way that I can. But it's been a journey. You know, I think when I first started sharing human design, everyone was like, this is so out there and no one knew what I was talking about. And it really wasn't until 2018 that things started exploding in a different way. I know it's interesting. I, I feel like um, it, it's almost time coded that all of a sudden people like were able to understand human design. It's so crazy. I have people that are like, I got a reading 10 years ago and none of it landed. And now we sit and they're like, just ready for it. So it's just about receptivity. And I think I also know because I work with so many companies, I expected a lot more skepticism than I've actually received. I feel like people love learning about themselves. So I've just like, I've experienced like openness <laughs> at every step of the way, which has been so cool to see. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I remember getting, you know, kind of in my a new age childhood getting like, there was some people into human design and I remember thinking like the, the actual graph, like the image is so cool, but I didn't, it didn't retain like astrology yeah. did for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so where, can you give us some background of human design and where, yeah. You, yeah. So human design has been around since 1987 and the founder, his name is Ra Uhuruhu. He's no longer alive. Um, But basically he had been an advertising executive in Montreal, was just like a really smart, interesting man, but ended up in Ibiza on his own and was walking home to his home, walking home one night and basically heard a voice. And the voice was like, it's time to work. And so for basically eight days and eight nights, he channeled the system and he just like received all the information, like kind of wrote it all down and then spent the next 20 years building it out um and now it's kind of like there are different institutions around the world sharing it and people translating and making it accessible in different ways but i think when i first started listening to all of his recordings i kind of expected somebody who was like much more like woo woo and more of a spiritual guide and he's just like so matter of fact and like a little bit jaded and very funny and it was just like it was so unexpected but i also so appreciate his perspective and how he brought it in but yeah he he's unbelievable he's no longer alive but human design like i said is just like taking on a new life right now Mm -hmm. Um, and did he describe the channeling? Like, did, would do, I mean, did he give any kind of, like, was he freaked out by it? I mean, I think that he, I felt like he was very obedient, you Mm -hmm. know? I think that he was like a little bit freaked out, but he also was just like so surrendered. Like he was just like embodying a whole different thing for that time. And like also human design is so, I don't know how, I mean, it sounds like you've gone a little bit in, but there's obviously always more to go. Like human design is so deep. Like I've been studying it for five years and there's still so much more to learn. And so like, it just blows my mind that it was like the roots of all that information was like broad in those eight days. But like, it just like, I mean, it it can speak to like how we're meant to eat and how we're meant to like which environments. And again, like so many layers around how we build teams. So there's just like so many layers that we can go deeper into too so like it really and when he also when it came through it basically came through as like this is kind of the first 21st century system that basically brings together and merges all the systems so like it pulls from astrology and it pulls from kabbalah and it pulls from the Ching and the chakra system and quantum physics and genetics and biochemistry all in its kind of master system to give us a blueprint I love that you say like it comes from the future because it totally feels like that it just feels like we've never really had our manual and human design just like gives us our unique manual yeah, we that's the way we talk about it that we feel like it is like few it's like alien technology that got totally. from another timeline basically. 100%. Yeah. You know, and that's why it's just like it basically is surfacing all the stuff that's underneath the surface that we've never had language for before, like all the energetics and just like helping us learn how to master ourselves, you know. And so people like don't need to learn their human design. They don't need to align with it, but often by doing it, like it just makes our lives feel so much better and also just like so much more successful because we like stop trying to be all the things that we're not and we just like remember who we are. And I think what I appreciate about human design is it's so rare that I sit with somebody and they like it feels unfamiliar. Like often I'm not telling people anything new. It's just like stuff they've never actually given themselves permission to step into. And so human design kind of gives them that self-knowledge and the tools to actually step into it. Well, I rem- I think part of the reason I like, like started giving it a little bit more, like paying more attention is that when I first met my husband, mm-hmm. someone like it was literally within the first couple of weeks, somebody like pulled up our, our, our yeah. profiles. Um, and we had the exact like match of, where where uh, where I'm empty, he's he has Defined, yeah yeah, and the other way around. Um, oh, cool. And, and so yeah, and he's a generator, and I'm a projector, and it just like it's such a it's a really like perfect. Yeah. And so I, and I knew it was perfect fit, but then I was like, all right, all right, all right. I want to you know this is I, there's something to be said here because he actually would say the words that I, he he has no uh, will. What what is it like the mm-hmm. will center? The will center, the ego, the heart. Um, he, that's an empty, is that what you call it? An empty Mm -hmm. open, open. He has that open and he would say that like before he met me. And of course I have that very active, um, energy projector then. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, (laughs) um, he said that like before he met me, he just had like that, the will to do anything was just not there. Yeah. And now you give it to him. (laughs) Yeah. And I just thought that was, that that kind of really kind of turned over my like understanding and just obviously the um, in the small way. So mm-hmm. so can you kind of break down some of the like yeah. I, I'm really curious about this eating thing too because I hadn't heard that. 
Um, can you break down the, the categories yes. and, the, and some layers? Yeah. So just for context, there are about 2 billion different configurations. So like everybody's incredibly unique. So at the highest level, there are five different types, but it gets so much more specific from there. So High level, there are manifesting generators, generators, projectors, reflectors, and manifestors. And so it looks like we have a lot of generators here. Um, yeah, I don't even know if we see, see any manifesting generators. Lots of, oh no, I do. Lauren, okay, cool. So manifesting generators and generators are really the ones that have the energy and the life force to kind of build and create and make things happen. They're really kind of meant to wake up in the morning with a full tank of energy to use up their energy in super satisfying ways throughout the day and then kind of crash and wake up recharge. If they're using their energy doing things that they enjoy and that kind of genuinely light them up, they're basically creating energy for like everyone around them. But when they're just like committing to things that they think they should or they're just like drain them, then like their battery goes so quickly. So like for your husband actually like making sure he's doing what he loves and like committing his energy to those things is actually going to bring so much more good energy into the relationship and allow you to kind of use that energy as well and um, the difference between the two is that manifesting generators often thrive when they have their energy in a lot of things at once these people are kind of multi-passionate by nature and aren't really meant to do just one thing but so often they've been made to feel scattered or like they're doing too much but like they need it all and they're often might get bored pretty quickly so allowing themselves to pivot when they're inspired to and they also move very quickly and so often need some support and kind of the smaller steps along the way. Um, for both generators and manifesting generators, their strategy is magnetism. It's like you've got all this energy to build and create and do things, but you're not meant to initiate and chase after things, but you're kind of waiting for life to come to you and waiting for something to kind of spark a gut response before you jump into it. Mm -hmm. um, does that resonate with what you know about your husband? Does that all make sense? Yeah. And I have my two like main kind of, um, working, managing business partners who, who, you know, ba manage things with me are both yeah. manifesting generators. <laughs> um, and so I was just curious about, cause I know there's a certain vibe with these manifesting generators completely like my team is more generators, but yes. the, the high level execs are more manifesting generators on yeah. the offer team. Yeah. Yes, which can be amazing when they have the right support. You know what I mean? When they can have the people that can like handle all the step-by-step -step details so they can just be in their creative flow and like be inspired and kind of go with it. Because they've got this energy to actually make things happen incredibly quickly because their like gift is out of efficiency rather than just like mundane detail piece. Hmm. Yeah. Compared to a generator where generators don't mind the details. You know, it depends. It's not like manifesting generators like do the fun work and generators do like the boring work. It's just like generators often like they love mastery, like they love going deep into something. But same for them, like they've really only got to commit to their energy to things that they really enjoy and like let go of the rest because they've got my partner as a generator as well. And like they've just got this amazing capacity to kind of like build things. But again, only when they're actually really lit up by the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got projectors. So projectors are really the ones that are here to kind of be like the leaders, the guides, the advisors, the teachers, very natural place for them to be as like a CEO and kind of running the show. Um, at, you're an energy projector. I'm also an energy projector. So it's like, we've got some energy, but the energy is really meant to operate in spurts and ebbs and flows. Yeah. So it's really not about like kind of pushing throughout the day and trying to have like consistent stamina. It's like leveraging the energy and it's there and resting when it's not. So often your gift as a projector is not in how much you can do, but it's more like in your guidance, in your perspective, in the way that you see the world. Perspector, sorry, projectors are so naturally sensitive to other people's energy. So that's what kind of makes them amazing guides because they know how to leverage people's energy. They can, or they can guide them with like, a psychologist, a therapist, a coach, you know, there's so many expressions of it. Um, and often projectors love systems, you know, love systems that like, whether it's Kundalini, whether it's human design, things that kind of help them understand how energy works and understand people and all the things. Um, our strategy as projectors is like waiting for a sense of recognition and invitation before engaging. Mm -hmm. And I think, which is basically because we bring something so unique to the table, it's just so important for that recognition and invitation to be there. I think when I first discovered that, I was like, how do I build a business? And like as a projector, and I've learned that like my biggest job as a projector is basically just like spreading the word about what I do and making myself visible and available so that like the invitation come but every time I try to like pitch or like reach out to a certain company it's just like nothing flies you know so it's just like my job is basically visibility and that's been like the most productive thing for me so how does that all resonate with you does that feel aligned with the way that you show up I mean well well this is an intro this is part of like the self um just self-awareness through this particular like archetypal system um they were my team knew you know that they were getting into this before me and they knew that I needed an invitation so they were <sighs> doing it to me before I knew what they were doing they'd be like would you like to come and take a look at this and I'd be like yes yes of course I want to take a look at it but like if they wouldn't have asked I wouldn't have come and taken a look at it 
you know, okay. so I do. I really, and then uh, the, the spurt thing is, I mean, I get more done in an hour than I get done yeah. in hours. I'm just, that's the kind I of, know. I, that's just how I am. I'm so curious to see your chart. Do you know if you have like one long line across? I don't. I, I'm. I, I, don't I, I can give you. I can get. I'll. I'll privately give you. Privately. I only ask because one of their there's a strength in in human design that is like it's all about kind of accomplishing more in like three hours and most people can in the whole day. But I think like you've got this very powerful ego, so it really is like you are an energy projector. You've got this amazing capacity, but it is going to operate in spurts, and so it's just like so important to kind of not burn yourself out. It is. I mean, I, I really and you know I turned forty this year, so I also. Um, I'm learning, you know, I'm the, a little bit that that four really brought a little wisdom, a little deeper deepening. It's true. I mean, it, it really does. And I definitely yeah. have been feeling like without the travel schedule, I've mm-hmm. been feeling a little bit more of my natural tendencies. Yes. Good. Yeah. And again, it's so good. Like I think as a leader, like just like having the right support and being able to delegate and like just such a natural position for projector and also in a teaching position, you know, also so natural. Mm -hmm. Um, So then we have, I'm going to look yours up in a second. So, but, so we now have manifestors. I don't know if we have any manifestors here, Um, but manifestors are really the ones that are here to kind of like initiate and get things started. The ones that are here to kind of get the ball rolling, not always here to do all the doing either, but just to like get something off the ground. Often one of the most, okay, Angelina, yay. Often one of the most important things for manifestors is having freedom and autonomy and control. They're really kind of not here to be told what to do or manage or guided in any way. They're very much here to do things on their own terms and in their own way. So they can often struggle a little bit if they're working for a company and being micromanaged. So it's like they often thrive when they're just given freedom. It's like, this is your domain, do what you please, let us know how it goes. Or if they're kind of an entrepreneur and charting their own path. their strategy is all about initiating and informing. And so what I mean by that is one, initiating, making the first move, whether that comes to dating, business, any of the things, but also about informing. Like they need to really keep people kind of um, up to date with what they're choosing and when, if they don't communicate what they're choosing, people can really resist them and become like a little bit suspicious. So just like letting people know when they're like making a pivot in the business, when they're coming home late, when they're getting up from the table, by just like letting people know what they're going to do before they do it, it kind of really puts everyone at ease because they've got this provocative initiating energy. And so it's just like so important to kind of keep people updated. So that's often the most unnatural piece for manifestors to kind of really um, work on, but it often just makes such a difference when they do. How, many, how much of the population are manifestors? Eight to nine percent. Okay, because I don't like I don't know consciously of any of them in my life. Yeah, they're yeah. definitely around, but you yeah. should keep an eye out. They're like, and I often like you know I every type kind of has like an energetic signature, kind of a way of showing up. So I often can like anticipate who, but like manifestors, I feel more than anyone else. Um, they just like have a very strong energy, um, yeah. and there's like an intensity and natural kind of impactful energy that they carry cool um and then we've got reflectors so i don't think we have any reflectors here which would make sense because they're only one percent um but reflectors are really kind of like our collective mirrors these are people that are incredibly sensitive to their physical environment and basically kind of always taking in everything in their physical space and mirroring it back so you really get a good sense of like how a community is doing our company is doing our team is doing just by how that reflector is showing up so one of the most important things they can do is just choose to be in spaces that feel good to them making sure their city feels good their office feels good their home feels good because they really attract the right experiences and opportunities when they're in the right spaces and what's so unique and this can actually be a little bit true for other types as well is that like but very true for reflectors is their identity is always shifting so they're going to have periods where they feel like a projector like a generator like a manifesting generator like a manifestor so it's so important to kind of embrace the fluidity of who they are and not try to put themselves into one box. Mm-hmm. And they also often carry this very kind of objective perspective and like powerful way of seeing things. So whenever I'm around a reflector, I'm just like asking them questions all the time. I'm like, well, what do you think about this? And what do you see about this? You know, because their perspective often is like, they're just seeing a lot of things that other people miss. Um, and I would also recommend for reflectors, especially um, to just like have time away from other people. Like it's so good for you to be around other people, but because there's so many ways in which you can take an energy, having time alone to kind of reset is going to be so essential. Mm-hmm. Um, My daughter's a reflector and Oh, really? She's in, um, you know, she, she got quite, and I'm wondering if this is common, but she had quite a career as a child actor. She wanted to, like she wasn't pushed to do it. Yeah. Um, And then there was a point where when she started to really like kind of go through puberty, she was, she she was getting a lot of weird, like psychic, like, you know, sexual energy, I think on her. Mm 
Um, but I, I, I was thinking about this in regards to just, yeah, the, the Hollywood and the child actor. And I feel like probably a lot of the, like, there's probably a good amount of those people who are reflectors. Yeah, I think that like, and especially because reflectors are always going to have this kind of like really open identity center so they can kind of like become anyone, you know, and so like Sandra Bullock is a great example of a reflector, but like they can really embody all these characters. So it is a natural place. Mm -hmm. And also they do kind of like, they kind of have a tendency sometimes, actually this is true for projectors and manifestors too, but like they can really tune into other people's sexual energy, work energy and kind of amplify it. So they're often very tuned into that as well. So those are the types, but um, let me know if there are other pieces that you're interested in going into. Well, like if somebody say, you know, they go to your, um, go to your website and get the, the file, what are you like in astrology? Would we look at the rising sign, the, the, the sun sign, the moon sign, right? What, what are the top three things you would tell people to look at mm-hmm. their chart? Yeah. Um, so there's so many layers. I think that like, I always recommend to start with the type, the strategy and the authority. So the type and the strategy is what we just talked about. The authority we can also talk about, which is basically how you're meant to make decisions. Um, there are so many, so one of my offerings called a blueprint and I created a discount code for your audience if they want to get there is, but it basically like it covers the type, the strategy, the authority, but also all the open areas, which are basically the areas where you are the most sensitive and likely to get taken off track, kind of how you best process information. We call that your definition, mm-hmm. um, what it looks like to be aligned or not aligned, um, your natural kind of strengths, like what comes innate to you, um, your profile, which is basically like an indicator in terms of like how you're really meant to kind of manifest your purpose. Like for you, it's all about this combination. I did pull up your chart of like needing to be like a hermit and being alone and just like you're meant to be like such a natural what you do like not doing the things that come hard but the things that come so easily and then also like all your opportunities are meant to come through your community and the people that you know and so your biggest work is to like cultivate your community and also honor the hermit dumb and kind of find your balance between the two um but those are the pieces that i think are so yeah so kind of immediately important and the things that are often the most actionable interesting yeah Yeah. people are surprised how much of a hermit i am do you feel like you honor that part of you um, I feel like I'm, it, it's so extreme that I have to, um, yeah. you know, because I literally get to a point where I can't like, I, I like can't form a sentence. Totally. Um, and my husband is very protective of me and like, this is the first time I've lived with a ma- like a man for like my adult life. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? I, I I lived with a guy, you know, a partner in my twenties, but I like I was like, oh fuck that, I'm never doing that again. So I lived on my own for a long time, and then you yeah. know, um, we fell in love. So it, he's like, you know, he really is into being around. You know, like he likes he's a homebody too, and he likes to be together. So that's like my challenge around my her- my hermitage because I have to like sneak away into corners of the house to just be, you know, happy. totally. Yeah. And like, and you've got so much openness in your design. When I mean, when I say openness, basically it's all the kind of the geometric shapes that are white and it's the areas where you're the most sensitive to kind of taking in other people's energy. And it's just so useful to know what those areas are because they're like where you're here to be wise, but also where you can get so taken off track. And I don't know if you've heard this aspect of human design, but the recommendation for projectors and manifestors and reflectors, especially, although I really do believe it's true for everyone is to sleep in your own space, you know? which I know is like not always financially feasible or even desirable to have your own bedroom or your own space. But the idea is because you're so sensitive, it's just like a little bit easier to wake up as yourself when you're waking up in your own energy um, versus kind of like, cause we're just being conditioned by each other all the time. And so it's really good to have time to kind of let go of all the stuff that's not ours. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, I mean, I, I have um, a room that is like the, the ISIS room here in the house. That's, mm-hmm. I'll, sh- I'll show you guys. That's the door to the room. Um, and though I don't sleep in there, it has like my 18 closets and like, you know, all sorts of other mysterious things. Um, but yeah, no, I feel grateful to have that because it is important. Yeah. It's so important. Um, you know, one aspect of your design. So one thing that I do recommend people look into is how they're meant to make decisions. So you're emotional. I don't know how much, have you gone deeply into that? Mm -mm. Oh, into like what, what that means. What that means? No. So basically, if you're an emotional decision maker, which is possible for projectors, manifestors, manifesting generators, generators, it basically means that you're really not meant to make big decisions impulsively or in the moment. 
really healthy to kind of sleep on things and feel into things before you commit because clarity does not come in the moment. It comes over time. There are a lot of people where it comes in the moment, but not for you and not for me either. And so like, and we're just kind of always riding these emotional waves. It's like kind of a chemical thing. You might not always know where you're on the high or the low. We're just like on a wave. And so the most important thing is to not make decisions on the high or the low, but basically like sleep on things to just give yourself a little bit of space and kind of making decisions from like a cooler and calmer place. Um, another thing for you to be aware of is that when you are an emotional decision maker, it means that you project your emotions out into the world and you kind of set, set the emotional tone of your space. So like my partner is the opposite where he basically takes in my emotions. So like when I'm on a high, he's going to really feel it when I'm on a low, he's really going to feel it too. So it's been so useful to be aware of that, to kind of know how to like when to be around people and when not to. Um, do you feel like you take your time when you make decisions? Does that resonate with you? I mean, I, I have the capacity to be a, when it's small decisions, I'm a great decision maker yeah. you know, and I can, I can, you know, easily, it's, I don't waffle. I'm very decisive. Um, but I am highly char well I would call it charged it's like yeah. I, there's always a lot of energy running through and like last night I had I had a shove a pre like on the phone at like 11 30 convincing her we should make a big decision and she was like I don't think so I really think we should sleep on this and I was like Rah! and then finally I was like okay 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 and, we, and we, we went to bed and we decided not to do it and I'm so glad we didn't do it last night so you know it is very true and thank god you know I have some people around me who are a little bit less less charged than I am when when the when the energy is running through totally yeah. you know and it's, it's exactly that where it's like you're on a high or a low and you're like yes let's do it and then you wake up the next day you're like mm, not the right <laughs> no, thing anymore you know what no, I mean it was so not the right thing <laughs> And it's just like, so it, that's been, you know, such a, that has really transformed my own life because I think that things used to feel a lot more chaotic when I felt that pressure to be more impulsive and like just, but also knowing the difference that like, if you're a sacral decision maker, or if you're a splenic decision maker, like you can actually make decisions pretty quickly. Like if you're sacral, it's like, it's all about your gut response in the moment. It's like, just like a yes or a no. It's like a visceral feeling that you can't explain. If you're a splenic decision maker, it's about your intuition, like, which is a little bit quieter and more just like a, a tingles that you feel or voice that you hear resonance. But like these people opposite to us are kind of meant to be like super impulsive and incredibly spontaneous when they make decisions. So it's just like, but soften, they've been made to feel like I've got to sleep on things or wait, you know, when actually they're designed to be so spontaneous in their decision making. So it is such a useful tool to understand how the people around us operate so we can honor kind of their unique way of doing it. How fascinating. And when you're saying splenic, do you mean like spleen? It is the, the spleen center. Mm -hmm. How cool is that? Yeah. So, so weird. That. I know. It's just like, so it is, it's, and it's just like this quiet knowing, you know, I think most often a lot of people kind of associate the gut with the intuition, but it is really distinguished in human design, where it's just like, again, gut is just like a visceral expansion or contraction and intuitive is just like a quiet knowing, you know? So it's just like, and it often takes a lot of work to tune into, whereas the gut is like a thing that you can kind of trigger by asking the right questions. Um, somebody asked what the self projected, which is another way of making decisions. And that basically is around just like talking things out. Like for those people, their truth comes when they give it a voice. So the best thing that they can do is surround themselves by people that they trust and just let themselves talk and let their truth just like tr just emerge. And so like having a coach or friends or partners that kind of where they create that space where they can kind of comfortably speak, um, which is like so often they've been made, 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 made feel guilty. It's like, can I really just talk things out? But like, that's exactly how they really connect to their truth. Hmm. Matali, um, uh, what's Robert? I'm curious. Matali, Matali works on the Rama, Rama team oh. and, and has an amazing husband that they've been together for a long time. Do you know what Robert is? Manifesting generator. So, and, and I'm assuming that you're a projector. It's just like, honestly, my, my partner, my romantic partner is also my business partner. And like, it's just been the most transformative to understand our designs because we're different in basically every way that you could be different. And I think that if we didn't have language for that, or like, it could be easy to just like kind of make each other wrong for it or want people want each other to be more similar. And so I think it's just been so empowering and created so much more compassion to be like, you're just wired differently. Like, how can I honor you in that? I mean, I think that um, I'm muting because my my dogs are having. They're they're they've they've turned out over a new solstice leaf, which is that they're going to bark at everything. Like they never they never barked, and then like 24 hours ago, they've decided that they they're going to try a new thing called barking. <laughs> um, <laughs> but okay, so do let's take some. Do you guys want to ask some questions? 
Yeah, if you guys have questions. So helpful with my kids. Yeah, I mean, Ra, the founder of Human Design, would always say that like human design is really for the kids because it's really useful for us about, um, it's really useful for us at any point in our lives, but it's especially useful like when we're parenting because you're basically giving kids permission to be who they are from day one. Um, and you're going to parent a generator super differently than you're going to parent a manifest or a projector, or all those things. Um, Donna asks, can you talk about the triple split and how to deal with COVID? So basically, you know, I talk about the definition. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. It's basically around how we're meant to best process information. And so if you are a triple split, it basically means that you really need to like move around. You need like flexibility and freedom. And you might feel like a little bit trapped or confined if you're like with the same person or the same team kind of all day, every day. And so a lot of people are a little bit confined right now. Um, so I would just say, Donna, for you, it's like even just like going for walks, like just getting outside, being around like, cause you don't need to be around like a person, but more just being around like public energy, like going to the park, like if restaurants are open or coffee shops, like just moving your energy around can be really useful. And if you're feeling stuck with a certain person, it doesn't mean anything's actually wrong with that person. It just means that you need to move your energy around. You need so much more freedom than that. Um, and so just allowing that. And like, it's obviously different doing stuff online than it is um, in person, but still connecting with people online can give you a little bit of that activation of being around other people. So just like knowing that you need freedom and like, again, knowing how partners process can be so useful. Like for you, you're actually collaborative or you're a split definition. Um, and it basically means that like you kind of also find wholeness by being around other people. So if you're ever feeling stuck, just like going out to like a park or a coffee shop or a restaurant can be really useful and kind of like connecting you in different ways or teaching a class or any of the things. Make sense? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So what if you don't know the exact birth time? So, you know, if you know the exact birth, if you don't know the exact birth time, I would just, if you know a range, that would be super useful. Um, because I think that sometimes it changes a lot and sometimes it doesn't change quite as much. So sometimes people will be like, I'm like born between like nine and 12, you know, so I'll check to see how much it changes over that time. So if you have a range, that would be useful. Sometimes like I worked with a woman who was adopted recently, there was no way of finding her birth time. And she actually wasn't totally sure of the day. So we just kind of like discovered all the different options together and like felt into what felt like her. Um, in terms of the incarnation crosses, those are actually a little bit hard to go into because there are 192 of them. So, um, but I would just say that one of my favorite resources for the incarnation cross is a book called The Book of Destinies. And I think the incarnation cross is an aspect of our design, which is really around how we're kind of here to manifest our purpose in a bigger way. And often it doesn't really manifest till a little bit later in life, but it's not very actionable. So it's a good thing to kind of remind yourself of. The profile piece is actually far more actual in getting you there. For example, like my incarnation cross is literally all about saying the same thing all day, every day and finding new ways to communicate it, which is like literally what I do all the time, you know? So I think it can be a reminder, like I'm on track, but again, the profile is actually the more actual piece that I'd recommend diving into. Yeah. Joanna, um, why don't you ask a question? Joanna's my work wife, I, my, my manifest Ooh. generator work wife. Let's find um, out about you. <laughs> I, I'm really, I, I like hearing how the projector and the manifesting generator can work well and be symbiotic. I, I do have some problems with projectors, uh, other project, like it's different. I, and I'm just curious, like, is that because of the, um, I don't know what it's called, the like with the four, six or the five, one, like, yeah. is that, can you get interlocks? in that way. So it's like, even if there, someone's a projector, like you're the, the thing works out well versus another projector where it's like, it's in a different shift. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So the question is really like, why do you feel like you work really well with some projectors versus a little bit less so with others? Yeah. So projectors are honestly like the most diverse of all types. You know what I mean? So it's like, you might be like, I'm so into this projector and this other one kind of like rubs me the wrong way in all the ways. So yes, it can be around the profile, but it can actually be around so many other pieces. Like I do a lot of partnership sessions, either with like co-founders or romantic partners, and you start to overlap the charts and be like, wow, this is where you're going to trigger each other, you know, and this is where you're held together. And this is what the emotional dynamic is and the communication dynamic. So there's so many factors that can play into it. 
So I think that like, yeah, just honor that, you know, honor the ones that feel right and like let go of the rest. Like I think that like it can actually be such a beautiful kind of work partnership to have like a manifesting generator and a projector or a projector and a generator. But like you've got to like love that projector, recognize that projector, like value them so much, you know, because I think as a projector, I can see personally like when we don't feel recognized, it's like the hardest thing ever. And so sometimes we might like seek it out and be like, see me, like recognize me. And if people aren't ready for it, it can be a little bit intense, you know? So it's really about just like only working with the right people that really do recognize you and really do invite you in but the partnership stuff is so useful because there's so many energetic dynamics that are really underneath the surface and human design just kind of surfaces it and really gives us language for it does that make sense yeah it's so interesting and I'd also say as a manifesting generator, like never expect the projectors to keep up with you. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> your gift is like doing all the things, moving as quickly as you want, pivoting between it all, but like they're not going to keep up and that is not their gift, you know? And knowing that again, projectors need recognition, need invitation and for projectors to never try to keep up either. Um, okay. So Donna said, are you better off with a partner opposite to you or with the same type strategy and inner authority? You know, it's such a good question. I've had people, had people be like, can we create like a dating app? You know, I'm looking for like an emotional generator, but like, that's definitely not the way that human design is meant to be used. I think that like, once you really have chemistry with someone, that is the perfect time to really dive in and be like, okay, how can you really just like, um, better understand each other and kind of support each other? Um, and so I think that if you have somebody who's very similar, then there's just going to be an understanding, like a companionship, like a just friendship it's like I just get you I see the way that you see the world I love it and so that and you guys can kind of learn a lot of those things together if somebody is really opposite there's a lot of attraction there you know because we're often so we're just like attracted to what we're not and so there can be such a dance there and such a beautiful dance as long as you honor how different you are I always say we get the most tripped up and we kind of expect a partner to be um, more similar to us or different than what they are but I think human design just allows us to honor the differences like for me knowing my partner's a generator he's got this amazing energy to build and create and do and I really can't keep up with him he makes decisions very quickly I like really take my time with things like he's really like in the details and needs to understand how things work whereas like I'm super aloof and like we just have this these differences that I think have been really wonderful and have allowed us to work together but only because we like aren't trying to be the same so I think it can work either way there are actually going to be so many other aspects of your design beyond the type the strategy the inner authority that can kind of speak to how best to be compatible together okay um, what's the difference between having many centers defined versus a few open? Um, my crown heart emotions are open. How is that different from a person who is open in many centers? So when the air, when you look at the chart, which isn't supposed to make a whole lot of sense, the areas are going to either be colored in or white. And when the areas are colored in, it basically is where you're drawing your energy from and the things that are operating in a more kind of consistent and reliable way. And so like, you know, if you have that defined willpower, it means like you've got this will to get things done when you're inspired to. Um, whereas if it's open, you might like your willpower might be a little bit more inconsistent. So when it's open, it's basically where you're the most open and sensitive to kind of taking other people's energy and can really amplify it. And so it's just what's consistent with you within you versus where you're the most sensitive. And I think that like I, for example, have seven centers defined and two open, but my experience in those open centers is very amplified. So it just is like, there's going to be a little bit more sensitivity if you have a lot open. But again, if you know how to work with it, it's like all wisdom, you know? So some examples of that, if you have an open emotional center, it means you're going to take in and amplify other people's emotions. If you've got an open identity center, it means that you can kind of really take on other people's sense of identity and your sense of identity is meant to be very fluid. Um, you know, if you have like an open sacral center, you might like end up doing too much and your gift is to kind of be wise about work and so there's just so many areas in terms of the openness that speak to both where we can get taken off track but also where we have the greatest capacity for wisdom um and so you said my heart crown heart emotions are open so yes open emo open emotions super empathic open heart means that like your willpower is inconsistent and so and you might have a little bit of an inconsistent sense of self-esteem so the most important thing for you to remember is that you're really not here to ever prove yourself and that's not meant to be a motivator and with the open crown it means that you've got the capacity to be so open and so inspired and have all the ideas in the world but you can also lose a little bit of focus so it's good to create lists and have simple structure to kind of keep you on track um in terms of the definition so Again, that's around how we best process information. So if you're a single definition, it means that you're a little bit more independent in how you process information. Um, you basically don't really need to be around other people to help you get clear and you can process information pretty rapidly. Um, people might sometimes be a little bit threatened by your independence. Like they might feel like you don't need them quite as much. Um, but for you, it's going to be so important to honor your independence, but also have the people around you honor it as well. Um, and just like be able to be in your own flow. You know, it's really interesting in partnership when one person is a split versus one person's independent because one person might be 
a little bit more just in their own flow and the other person like wants to collaborate in a different way. So again, so useful to really understand those differences. Cool. Um, let's talk about the profile. So the Incarnation Cross, I did recommend the book, The Book of Destinies. I really, it's, I think it's not very useful to go through them now just because there are so many of them, but I would, I think that's a great resource and I would recommend just kind of sitting with your own. Um, and there are actually a lot of different variations of the Cross of Eden. Um, in terms of the four, six, so there are 12 different profiles and they do really speak to how we're here to manifest our purpose. So it's going to be some combination of two numbers, like a six, two or four, six or one, three. So if you have a four in your profile, it basically means that, and this is true for you too, Guru Jagat, is like all about your community and your network. You know, it's like your opportunities are all meant to come from the people that you know. And the best thing that you can do is like cultivate your community and your network and just like trust that like, that's how you're going to meet people that you date. That's how you're going to like have business opportunities. Like it literally all comes from the people that you know, and it's really good for you to be friends with the people that you work with. So just actively creating that community. If you have a six in your profile, it means that these people are very natural kind of role models where they can kind of really like, just like stay above the fray and offer like a very objective perspective and way of seeing things. Um, and they often live their life in three phases where the first 30 years is a lot of trial and error and bumping into things and making mistakes. Um, and then 30 to 50 is kind of a time of stepping back and observing and processing all the things that you've learned. And these people are kind of really meant to hit their prime when they turn 50. And it doesn't mean that you have to wait for anything. It just means that there's like an embodied wisdom that comes as you get older. Um, so it's just like, I, I love working with people that have a six line because their life just like keep ch keeps changing. And then, um, if you have a one in your profile, it basically means there's a very natural investigative nature to you. It's really healthy to kind of get into the details of things and really understand how things work, um, and build a strong foundation in whatever it is you do. If you have a two, we touched on that a little bit earlier. It means that you are a natural hermit and also very much meant to be kind of a natural at what you do. So not doing the things that feel super hard, but doing the things that feel really easy and natural if you've got a three it means that you like learn through trial and error um, and so just like really like you're here to bump into things and make mistakes and you're never meant to get it right the first time so honoring that process and then finally if you have a five um, it basically means that you really are such a natural like savior and leader and fixer and problem solver but you're not here to fix all the things and people can often project that you can fix all the things so so important to really tune into your authority that way of making decisions to know what you're available for and what you're not Okay. I have a lot of projector friends. What is the best way to honor their design? How do you feel recognized? So, you know, and you don't want to do it in, um, you don't want to do it like in an inauthentic way, but I think just like really like starting to pay attention, like where do they uniquely bring value like what do you appreciate about the way that they see the world or maybe the way that they provide guidance or support to you so just kind of like recognizing the things that you really see in them and inviting them in to share their perspective you know like my partner knows this about me so he'll like kind of jokingly invite me into our relationship like every month it's like and it's just like and it's not always serious but there is something about like yes I still want to be in this yes I still feel recognized you know so it's just like really kind of just like shining a light on them and creating opportunities for them and creating space for them to share, knowing that they really operate best when that invitation kind of opens the door for them. Um, and also, you know, my partner has facilitated so many opportunities for me as well. And that's been so useful as a projector. Um, so yeah. Pay, and again, if you have a projector kit, it's like, what is their unique way of seeing the world? Like, like seeing the world, not like showering them with unnecessary flattery, but more just like paying attention and really inviting them in and giving them space to be themselves. Um, let's see. I'm very new to human design. How do I go about getting a profile and a basic interpretation? So um, yes, if you want to look it up, erinclairjones.com slash look up. There are lots of ways to dive in. Um, one of my offerings, which is like, I think is such a great way to get started is something called the blueprint, which is basically a 30 page PDF on your unique design. And it kind of covers all the key pieces we talked about today and like so much more. So it's kind of meant to be like the just manual that you keep returning to. And so I'll put the link here and I'll also put the discount code. But, and then I, I also do sessions and, immersive workshops and all the things, but I think having, having that kind of written manual that is just unique to you can be so powerful and whether or not it's for your kids or your partners or any of that. The discount code is RamaFest. Um, I'm a four, six. The parenting, the parenting thing is quite fascinating. I know, right? Is there, are there any books on that? Or are you going to write a book on that? Oh my God. There is, there are no books on it. I know. I feel I like you're going to be writing books on the, on these. I know. I are will. I a book? No, I like talked to a bunch of publishers. I just like, I, um, I honestly don't know how in the world I would have time to write a book right now. I hear you. I think, 
Yeah. You know what I mean? I think you know, you know this, like I just, and I am so like, there's nothing that excites me more about that. But I think that like the, it's, things are just so busy right now that I think as soon as we, um, you know, take me out of the process and I have more space, I would love to, because again, it's just like, and whether it's for business or parenting or all the things like human design, just like, again, transforms our lives by giving us permission to be ourselves. And I think when you really give kids permission to be who they are from day one, it's just so powerful. You know, I think we often just like don't have their blueprints. So we don't really know how to manage them or support them in a way that's actually going to help them as they grow older. And so often we have so much deconditioning to do because we were like raised totally unlike who we were. And it's my, so I'm a projector. My father's a projector. And so it was actually so useful learning that because again, I think we're so similar. So I kind of learned a lot from him growing up, but it's just, it's just the most useful, you know, and knowing that, for example, like generators are meant to like use up their energy throughout the day, like, and kind of like when they use up their energy, they can sleep soundly and well, like if you give like a generator a set bedtime, like they're just never going to be able to sleep, you know, but if you like really just support them in using up their energy and like in all the ways and they're going to crash and probably feel so much better. And like as a projector, you know what I mean? Like letting them sleep in their own space, like recognizing them, inviting them in, encouraging them to take rest. Same with the reflector, you know, the reflector kid, it's like creating their own sacred space they can return to. And like knowing that like they really need to balance time alone with time with people. So there's so much, but it's just like, it really, is so powerful to kind of understand that and also understand what the dynamic is with you and your kid and kind of what you guys are triggering in each other. So oh, interesting. You are going to write a lot of books, Erin. Uh, I'll just break it to you right now. <laughs> I mean, it feels so fun. I can't wait for it. Um, do the, you cross with the Gene Keys at all? I don't work with the Gene Keys in terms of crossing them. I do have a lot of friends that work with the Gene Keys. And, you know, as you probably know, the foundation is I mean, because you're asking is very similar. The founder of Gene Keys, um, Richard Rudd, was one of the first students of human design. And so it's basically kind of a beautiful extrapolation of the incarnation cross and other aspects of human design in a more kind of contemplative way. Um, and I just did a podcast on human design and Gene Keys with a woman named Natalie Miles. And it's a great kind of conversation of the two. But um, I find that like human design can be very like simple and actionable, like to the point. And Gene Keys is more like an activation and kind of a more contemplative journey. Um, the book is called The Book of Destinies. Um, thank you. Thank you. Help me so much better answer my kids and how to thrive. Amazing. Yes. Um, I use the human design for navigating my kids. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's really so powerful and so enlightening. And it honestly just creates so much more compassion and understanding for like who's around us and how to like better support them and being exactly who they are. Yeah. So Amazing. good. Erin, I, I, I love, um, you know, we met at Assemblage and it's just yeah. it's beautiful to see you. Um, you feel so much more relaxed and just <laughs> radiant than when I, when I saw you. you had, left yeah. out that part of my journey. Yeah, go ahead. Girl, that was, that was, you were, I mean, you were running the show, but it was, it was, yeah, I'm so happy to see how happy you Oh my God. Yeah. It was such a, it was, you know, so I, I started a human design company in 2015 with my former business partner. No one was ready. And then I met the founder of the assemblage, Rodrigo Nino, who actually recently passed and was like one of the most amazing men in the world. But he basically invited me and he's like, Aaron, like, you've got to like run the show here, but also like you have to bring human design. So I was just doing way too much. I was doing human design for everyone. I was running all the programming, but I was very much trying to operate like a generator. And it was just like, I really, you know, being able to go off on my own and like do this again when people are ready for it has been such a magical journey. And yes, I feel a lot better. Yeah, I can tell you're it's, I mean, I know how capable you are, but I'm happy to see like the- Don't thrive. Yeah. Yeah. It's so yeah. Um, exactly. How about one more? Do we have one more question? Burning question? Anyone? Um, I don't know if that's a question, Dorota. <laughs> it, it's a statement slash question. <laughs> I'm a manifesting generator. Great. Yeah. Um, and again, the sacral authority is going to be for the people that it's all about your gut response, you know, and it's just like, there's so much talk out there, like follow your gut, listen to your gut and not all of us have a gut response, you know, for the people that are sacral decision makers, like it really like follow your gut, listen to it in the moment. I don't even have a gut response. Thank you so much. Now I understand it so much better. Yay. So glad to hear that. Cool. I know it's a, it's a real transmission and you do it like, so it's like very quickly. Um, and I know it's, it's so complex. I have one more quick question, yeah. which is 
where does the dietary stuff come? Like, where does the lifestyle, how does that like intersect? I'm so curious. I know. So there's actually another software. So I'll look yours up later and send it to you because it's actually like when you look up that human design chart online, the food piece isn't even included in there. It's like not even all the chart is included in there. And when you look it up on a deeper software, all these pieces, but human design can really speak to like, you know, for example, like how I meant to best digest food is like when there's a lot of activity around me, like I need a lot of stimulation. Like I'm not meant to be super sedentary and like sit at a meal forever, but it's like eating when I'm walking, eating when I'm standing up, like, which I've always done and made myself wrong for. There are other people that are like meant to, you know, eat when the sun sets or like eat when it's light outside or like eat when the right music is around them or just like eat food that's like above body temperature. So it's less about like what and more about like how things are prepared and like basically just like how your digestive system will operate at its best. I think one thing that I can tell just looking at the kind of surface level of your design is that it is really good for you to eat in a more consistent way. Mm. Like you've got a very powerful brain that just like needs fuel. And so it's like, you know, I'm, whereas I'm like super inconsistent, like I'm often not hungry till later in the afternoon. Like for you, it's like eating when you wake up, eating before you teach, like, I mean, with a break before you teach, you know, eating lunch, dinner, snacks, like you just kind of need that fuel to kind of operate in an optimal way cognitively. Yes. And I've been in the- feel that? I do. I mean, that's my generator husband's up my ass about it. Cause I'm actually, I'm very inconsistent and he's like, you need, like you have to. And so I, I, I do much better when I do it. I do much better. Your brain just needs it. Yeah. You know? And like, so it is, it's so funny how, and it can also speak to like environments, you know, and that's on the deeper software as well, where it's like, you, it's like some people it's good to like live up high, you know, whether it's in New York, like living in like on the third floor, or whether it's like living on a mountain, who knows? Like there's just so many layers. Um, do you want me to answer these last questions in the chat? Yeah, if you have, yeah. Yeah. So somebody said, can you talk about the strategy to respond in business? So basically all generators and manifesting generators, their strategy is magnetism. It basically is about letting life to come to them and kind of waiting for a gut response before they engage. It doesn't mean you need to wait for an invitation and it's actually not meant to be a very passive thing. It's just about kind of like opening up your awareness and paying attention to what triggers your gut. And as soon as you get that gut response, you can make something happen. Like maybe you see someone on Instagram, you're like, I want to reach out to them. Maybe you're like looking at jobs and you get like a kind of a gut activation and like respond to that, but you're waiting for that gut response before pursuing. And then somebody asked about the difference between manifesting generators, generators, manifestors. So manifesting generators and generators are kind of the most similar here because they're like the ones that have the energy to build and create and do. Manifesting generators are some kind of combination between the two. So you might recognize, like kind of recognize yourself on the manifestor piece, but manifesting generators often thrive when they have their energy, a lot of things at once, multi-passionate by nature and move very quickly. Whereas generators are more kind of about mastery one thing at a time and then pivoting when they need to. Manifestors, like they are really the ones that are here to initiate, not always here to do all the doing. So they have energy, but it often does operate in spurts rather than kind of sustained throughout the day. Um, thank you so much. This has been so cool to just catch up with you and just of get course. a dose of your wisdom. Um, Aaron Claire Jones.com. Um, and, uh, Aaron was so sweet to offer, um, everybody at Rama festival, um, a, a, a code. The wrong link. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. In the, um, in the, in the swag bag. So, um, it's, uh, it's there in the swag bag. And also, did you write it here? Aaron? I did, but I, I put the wrong link for the thing. Yes. The code is Ramafest and the, um, it's for the blueprint, which is, I just put the link there. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and can't wait. I know Joanna, we're going to, we're, 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 I would love to have you come and work with the, yeah. with the team at some point. I mean, the team stuff is honestly, it's, it's what got me into human design and it's just yeah. like, it's so transformational in a team setting. So it's, yeah, I'm really, really excited. Um, all right. Well, be well, take care. You, Good you to too. see you. Good and to see you. Have, have a, beautiful, a beautiful day. Yes. Yeah. Bye. Bye you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Reality Riffing. These are conversations that I think are important with people who are doing great things in the world about subject matters that need to be discussed. If you enjoyed the content, the conversation, please feel free to share with your people, share with your friends and family, rate the podcast below, and also subscribe.